Good morning, Trinity. Good morning, Trinity. And good morning, Trinity Online. Good morning. Welcome to church this morning. You made it through the frozen tundra. It is great to see you this morning. I'm ready to worship the Lord, lift high the name of Jesus. Um, we're very thankful for you and both those of you here in the building as well as those of you that are joining us online. We want to welcome those folks as well. I've got a handful of announcements. The first one is that last Monday, uh, the Salt Life Bible Study. Uh, that meets 6 to 8 o'clock here with Jerry, um, started off, and that went real well. We're excited about that. Um, our women's Bible study, Terry Glass is going to facilitate it, and it's going to be the uh, Priscilla Shire uh, study on the book of Elijah. And the deadline for signing up is February the 7th, so make sure, ladies, that you do that. Um, it starts February the 22nd, so um, we're looking forward to that one also getting started. Our small groups are continuing to meet uh, on Wednesday night at 6 right now, um, and youth meets tonight um, at their normal time. 
Uh, and they went to the movie Spider-Man Friday. It was a great time. I went and joined them as well. We had a lot of fun and very thankful for them. I've got two quick things that I want to say. The first one is this. I am very thankful for the fact that, that we have some great preachers who are able to preach here when I'm not preaching. Matt's preaching for us today, and Jerry Lewis did last week, and Charlie does sometimes, um, who um, preach the Word, and they preach it. Um, by the leadership and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and I'm very thankful for each one of those folks that do that on a regular basis. And the other thing is, in a little bit, Michelle's going to lead us in prayer. One of the things that she's going to pray about um, is Ukraine. And, and I saw a pastor being interviewed from the Ukraine uh, this past week, and he said that the citizenry there for the last, I think it was eight years, have been digging trenches around their cities um, in order uh, to for this day when Russia would attack they have been preparing for this time for a long time and he believed that the reason Russia is doing what they're doing is that the freedom that the Russians see exhibited by the nation of Ukraine right next door um, threatens his power grip on his own people and they don't want to he didn't want them to see that and that's why they're coming um, so we want to pray for them. We really want to pray for Christians. He believes that the freedom there is really great, and the gospel's been shared and is spreading in the country of the Ukraine. So we're going to pray about that in a little bit. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your presence here and for the privilege of worshiping you and knowing you. We ask, Lord God, that everything that we do here today would be in spirit and in truth, that that it would line up with your word and that it would be spirit-empowered and guided. And that you would fill us with your spirit. Help us, Lord, to honor you. Help us to love and cherish one another. And help us, Lord, to be ready to serve you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you're able, if you would, let's stand and worship God in song.
Father, we just praise you and give you glory as we sing that you will do great things with Ukraine and you will keep us not selfish with our freedom, but pray that we do the right thing and that you bless, bless our town especially because they end up on the front lines, Lord. We just give you glory and pray earnestly for them and for us in Jesus' name. Bow at his feet, he has some great things. See what a savior is done. See how his love overcomes. He has some great things. He has some great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every. offering. Lord, we expect you to do great things. Amen. Amen and amen. Please be seated. Please pray with me. God, you have done great things throughout history, throughout the entire world. God, you have done so many good and glorious things for us and for your glory. And we give you thanks for that. God, we thank you that you are with us always. We do ask that you be with 
the Ukraine and all of your children all over the world who are who are suffering, who are hurting, who are preparing for war and, and hurt, God, we just ask that you surround them, that they will know that you are with them, that you are for them, and that you will never leave them, that you will guide their leadership of not only the Ukraine, but of Russia, but of all of our leaders around the world, that they will have your wisdom that can only come from you to make wise decisions for the people that they are over. That the decisions that they make will glorify you. That they will not do harm to others. God, we thank you that no matter what happens, that you are walking beside us and that we don't have to worry and we don't have to have fear because you are sitting on the throne of glory. And though this world may perish one day, there will be a new heaven and a new earth that we will be able to worship you forever in paradise. And so, yes, at this, on this earth, there will be suffering and there will be hurt, but we can look to you and know that one day, if we are in you and we have a relationship with you, that we don't have to fear, that we can walk through this earth with our heads held high, standing in our faith in you, because you are the one true God, and you are the name above every name, and we don't have to worry or have fear that we can worship and sing hallelujah, that you have done great things, hallelujah, that you have overcome, and hallelujah, that you are with us forever. God, we thank you so much for this. Thank you for those who are hurting and suffering, who are sick and unwell. We thank you that you are with them that you will bring healing to them, that you will bring healing to Bradley Jones and everyone else who is sick. God, we thank you for this. We thank you for your son. And we thank you for the opportunity to worship you freely with all of our hearts, our souls, and our minds. In your precious son's name we pray. Amen. At this time, we want to in invite our children to be dismissed for Children's Church. You guys can come this way. Good morning, Trinity. It is good to be with you again this morning. It's always wonderful to gather together as a community where we can worship God together with one voice, uh, praising Jesus who is worthy to be praised. Steve mentioned it a while ago. We, you've had kind of your entire pastoral lineup lately, had not you? You had Jerry last week, and you've got me today, and you've got Steve next week. And uh, it's good to have a full complement of our pastoral staff in the church, and we're very thankful for that, and we give God 
the glory for it. Let's go to God in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that we can gather together, that we can be in one accord in one voice and praise your name to glorify you. Lord, we ask that you would come fill us this morning, that you would pierce our hearts with the words that you would have us hear. In your precious name we pray. Amen. As I was preparing for this sermon and talking to God about what he wanted me to say this morning, he kept laying something on my heart that I really wasn't feeling. Has that ever happened to you before? I'm sure it has. Have you ever gone to God and asked him a question and the response you got back from God was not the response you were looking for? So you're like, man, that wasn't God. It's got to nah, be something else. That absolutely couldn't have been him. That's not what I was feeling this week. And so I really didn't want to do this topic that he laid on my heart. But as the days passed, I found him giving me more and more material to use on the topic and it became more evident of what he was looking to do. And all of a sudden, it all came together. But the topic is this. The topic is loneliness. Seems like a fun topic, doesn't it? Loneliness. So as I was researching for the sermon, I ran across a few jokes about loneliness, and so I'm going to apologize before I even tell them. All right? I'm going to get that out of the way right now. Number one, one out of five people suffer from loneliness. So if you look around and you don't see the other four people, they're out having fun without you. Who is the loneliest reindeer on their birthday? Now, I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking it's Rudolph. But I can tell you this. Nobody wants to go to a Donner party. I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry. One day, God visits Adam as he walks through the Garden of Eden. He says, my son, I've, I've decided to end your loneliness and give you a companion. She shall be called Eve. And she will be beautiful. She will never age. She will always stay faithful and be loyal to your every command. She will fulfill all your desires and make you feel complete as a man. To which Adam replied, that sounds good. What's it going to cost me? God, smiling back, says, only two ribs, my son. And scratching his head, Adam asked, what can I get for one? I've told you all, I'm sorry. I apologized up front. I did. Loneliness. In fact, I titled this sermon, One is a Lonely Number. One is a Lonely Number. Loneliness may not be an exciting topic for us to talk about, but it is definitely something that we all struggle with. In fact, if we're really honest with ourselves, loneliness is something that we all face, and it can leave us in this depression or this anxious state. There was a study, a survey done by Cigna Healthcare in 2019, and they polled 20,000 Americans, and this is what they found. 46% of Americans report sometimes or always feeling alone. That number has doubled over the last 50 years. 43% say they sometimes or always feel that their relationships are not meaningful. 20% say they rarely or never feel close to people. 47% say they rarely or never have meaningful in-person interactions with others. 13% of the people surveyed said that they have zero people that know them well. And here's one that really caught me off guard. 64% of young adults say they struggle with feelings of loneliness. Guys, this was 2019. This is pre-pandemic dealing with loneliness. Look at the the loneliness the pandemic has caused. We're kind of coming out of this reclusive state now, right? But it just seems like this virus will mutate and it pops up again and all of a sudden we're isolated and we're back home stuck away from each other. In fact, there are places in our country right now that are still in lockdowns. Now, luckily for us, we live in a time where we can be connected even when we're not present together, right? We have the technology together globally. There are people all over the country watching this right now. So that's great. We're, we're, we're so happy that we have that. In fact, it's easier now than ever for you to evangelize. Did you know that? All you have to do is click like and share on the content that the church is putting out, and you're instantly putting a message of Jesus out into the world to the people that know you. So do it. Click and like and share, whether you're watching on Facebook or you're on YouTube. Subscribe, subscribe to the channel and then share the link with someone else. It's never been easier for us to evangelize, and we're so thankful to have this technology. But again, if we're honest with ourselves, sometimes that very technology leaves us in lonely places. Have you ever been to a restaurant and watched a family of four sit there and all four of them are on the phone and nobody's talking to each other? Sometimes technology can leave us 
in lonely places. So even though this technology is great, it's not quite the same as being present with each other. I think you would agree with that. There's just something about gathering together to be present with one another. If those statistics from, were from 2019, if loneliness was such a big issue before the pandemic, I can only imagine how prevalent it is now. I told you the story about my mother during the uh, first year of the pandemic. You know, I was trying to do the right thing and, and kind of stay away as, from her as much as I could and, and, and try to keep her safe. But after a couple of months of that, she called me and she said, I would rather die than live like this. Get in your truck and drive over here and give me a hug. Loneliness is a powerful thing. And it's a tough thing to face. So this morning, I want to talk a little bit about a man who was extremely lonely. He was desperately lonely. And then I hope we can look at a couple ways that might help us curb loneliness amongst us and amongst our society. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark. It comes from the Gospel of Mark. Now, Mark's full name is John Mark. John was his Jewish name, and Mark was his Roman name. Mark is the nephew of Barnabas, who traveled around with Paul. They went on missionary journeys, and there's a whole lot more to that story, uh, but I'm not going to get into all that now. I just wanted you to know a little bit about Mark. Mark's theme through his entire gospel is to picture Jesus as a servant man or picture Jesus as a servant God. And so we find ourselves this morning in Mark chapter 1. Let's stand for the reading of the gospel this morning. Mark chapter 1, we're going to be in verses 35 through 45. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up. Now, I don't know about you, but perhaps Mark is foreshadowing something further down the line when it's very early in the morning, and Jesus got up. He left the house, and he went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. And Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. And so he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. And a man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus was indignant. And he reached out his hand and he touched the man. He says, I am willing. Be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone. But go, show yourself to the priests and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for, you, for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead he went out and he began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would open our hearts to your words this morning and nothing less. In your precious name we pray, amen. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. You may be seated. There is so much in this text for us this morning, and we're going to look at a couple other scriptures as well, but this passage has so much to offer us. And so I'm just going to start in verse 35 right there. Verse 35 says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. So let's just pause here and, and make sure that we understand the difference between being lonely and being in a quiet time with Jesus. Jesus made time early in the morning to go be in a quiet place. Some translations even call this part a lonely place, a solitary place. You see, Jesus is at, at this time is at kind of the peak of his notoriety. He's starting to become extremely popular amongst the crowds. He's kind of reaching this, this pinnacle in his ministry. He's healed many people, and he's cast out all these demons, and so his popularity is just on the rise. And so Jesus had to find time to go be by himself. And to go be with the Father. He went alone. Left his disciples to go be with the Father. To go listen and be in communion with his dad. Now I'm not talking about those type of times you spend with the Father where you're praying and you got the list. You, you know what I'm talking about, the list. 
where you're listing all the things off that you're asking God for, you know, the, those that are around you that are sick, that need healing, and, and all of that stuff, the craziness that's going on in the world. You know, we all make those lists. Those are good. I'm not, not trying to say we shouldn't have those. But in these moments, I believe that Jesus went to commune with the Father to just be with him and get his purpose for the day, to get his marching orders for the day. Those times where we're in real communion with the Father so that he can stay grounded in what God had called him to do. And so that brings us to our first point this morning. Point number one on your outline is this, is don't confuse loneliness with being alone. Don't confuse loneliness with being alone. Finding time to be alone is a good thing. I mean, in this crazy world that we live in where we're bombarded with messaging all the time, this constant source of entertainment, the same phone that I have my Bible app on, I've got a thousand other apps that can draw my attention away. We're constantly bombarded with messaging. It is a good thing to find time to commune with the Father. So I don't want us to confuse the concept that loneliness is the same as being alone. It's not. In fact, think about it for a minute. Some of the most popular, some of the most successful people are lonely. Some of the most popular ones are lonely. They're surrounded by people all day long, but they find themselves lonely. I'm thinking of folks like Robin Williams. People who seem like the most outgoing, funny people, surrounded all the time by people, and yet they find themselves with a lonely feeling. So loneliness is not synonymous with being alone. Let's keep going this morning. I'm going to start back at verse 35. Very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up. He left the house and he went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and some of his companions, or and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. All right, so Jesus had to get off by himself. He left the disciples behind, right? He had to go to a quiet place. I, I found, or didn't, maybe we didn't even realize this, but before the pandemic, there were times where, you know, getting up and going to work was a break. You know, you kind of get out of the house for a minute. You know what I'm saying? Especially you mothers who have a whole lot of children in the household, I, God bless you, right? It, sometimes getting out of the house is a break. I, used, I travel a lot, and sometimes going on travel can be a break. It's not that we don't love our families and don't want to be there, but it, it's just one of those things that sometimes you got to get away. And then the pandemic happened, and you couldn't get away, Right? And so people started finding these hiding places in their house that they would go be in. I've had pastors tell me that they had to go find hiding places to get away for a little while just to catch their breath. It's not that they're not present parents. They just had to get away for just a moment. And so they go find these places, and they said their kids have taken to FaceTiming them in their own house to find where they are. Sometimes it's good to go be alone. And so Jesus had to go get away and be alone, and along comes Peter, right? And Peter comes up, and they, it says that, that it, they went to look for him. The Greek actually says that they tracked him down. Where's my phone? Right? So they tracked him down, and you get there. I could just see Peter's face. Rabbi, everybody's looking for you. And what's Jesus' response to that? Jesus replied with, Let's go somewhere else. Verse 38, Jesus replied, Let's go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. That is why I have come. Point number two on your outline this morning is this. Popularity is different than purpose. Popularity is different than purpose. Jesus knew the difference He's at a, a peak of his ministry, right? He's at this peak where everybody's looking for him. He's done healed so many people and cast out demons. And, and Peter comes up to him. He goes, Rabbi, everybody's looking for you. We got to get back out there. You're doing really well in the polls. Everybody wants to see you. We got to get back out there and have some face time with people and show people. And Jesus' response to that was, let's go somewhere else. Because Jesus knew his purpose. His purpose wasn't to come be this notarized, famous person, but he came to change hearts. And so Jesus says, let's go somewhere else so that I can preach there also. This is why I have come. And notice right after that, as they go out and they start doing that and preaching around, a man, in verse 40, says, a man with leprosy came to him, and he begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. 
If you are willing, you can make me clean. We've got to understand this a little bit. If you want to understand leprosy, you can go look at the Levitical law. It's in Leviticus chapter 13. But you've got to understand a couple of things about uh, leprosy. These folks... When they, they would go to the, the priest, if they had a spot on their skin, right, and if it was just superficial, they would walk in and they could go back home. But if it had gotten underneath the skin, this bacterial infection, that's what leprosy is, then they would mark it. And they would send them home for a week, and then they'd have to come back. And if it had gotten bigger or it had spread, then they were automatically cast out and considered unclean. And they would have to go live outside the community by themselves, out away from everybody else. In fact, they had to wear torn and tattered clothes so that you could identify them from a distance and you knew who they were. Get this, they even had to wear a face covering over half their face and live out away from everyone else. How lonely that must be. We don't know a whole lot about the leper. We don't know a whole lot about, we don't even know his name in this process. How lonely it must be to be this man wonder what his backstory was. I mean, has he had this for a long time? Has he just had it for a little while? Perhaps he's married and has kids. wonder how long it's been since the last time he held his daughter. He's all alone. He's so alone, in fact, that they couldn't even come near anybody. They'd have to walk into a room, and before they could even walk in, they had to stop and announce, unclean, unclean. They had to say it two times. Unclean. Unclean. How lonely that must be to only be known by your issue, to not be known by your name. Unclean. Can you imagine? What if when you walked in the door this morning, whatever the issue is that you're facing in your life right now popped up on the screen up there as you walked in the door? Would you still come? You see, this leper had something very visible on the outside that everybody could see. But we've all got issues. We've all got things inside that sit on our soul and sit on our heart. We've all got scars and things that we deal with. What if your issue that you're dealing with right now is what you were known for? What if it's pride or arrogance or thief or adulterer, selfishness? What if whatever issue you face in life was what you were known for and not your name? This man was only known for his issue. He was only known as unclean. So much so we don't know any of the backstory of the man in, in, the, in this chapter. Jesus looked at him. Verse 41 says, Jesus was indignant. That one caught my attention because at first I was like, why was Jesus angry? I don't understand, right? But then I realized that indignant wasn't just about something being unfairly done to you. But it could be mad about being something unfairly done to someone else. And he was probably thinking about this man. He's all alone, desperately alone in a place that he can't even come into community without screaming unclean. Jesus was indignant, and he reached out his hand, and he touched the man. He says, I am willing. Be clean. And immediately, the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. You know, one of the other things in Levitical law that you can do is that if a leper comes near you, you are allowed to pick up a stone and cast it at him to keep him away from you. Because anytime something clean comes in contact with something that's unclean, what is clean is now marked unclean. And so he could have picked something up and chunked it at the man. And the man was so desperate that he was willing to push through that no matter what happened and fall at Jesus' feet and say, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus touched him and made him clean. And the clean didn't become unclean at that moment, but the unclean became clean. Jesus said, this is what I came to do. This is my purpose, is to reach hearts, to meet people in their issues, to meet them in their lonely places. We discussed a few weeks ago how Jesus is more often in the interruptions, and he's seldom in our plans, right? Here's a man who's come along, and he's fell at Jesus' feet, and he's interrupted him, and Jesus has just got done saying, let's go do what I came to do. 
this wasn't an interruption for him. For us, it would be. But for Jesus, he was out to clean people with their issues. Verse 43 says this. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you tell this, that you don't tell this to anyone. Let's pause right there for just a second. The Greek actually makes this so emphatic that he did the strong warning that it's like his nostrils flared when he said it. See that you tell no one. Y'all have heard of, of little baby Jesus, you know, six pound, eight ounce baby Jesus. Some of you may have heard of superstitious Jesus. Have you ever heard of snorting Jesus? Jesus is very emphatic with what he says to him there. See that you go tell no one. But go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing. Instead, the man went out and he began to talk freely, spreading the news. So as a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but he had to stay outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. As I was reading this, uh, you know, it makes you question some things in your head. Like, Jesus knew what the man was going to do, right? He tells him, don't go tell anyone. And you want to go, well, Jesus, you know what he's going to go do. Why did you even heal him in the first place? I mean, you, it's not like you didn't know that the guy was going to go out and run his mouth and tell everybody, even though you just told him not to do so. Why would you do it? And like a brick wall, it hits you in the face. Jesus said, I know that you're going to struggle even after your encounter with me, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to meet you in your issue anyway. Do you not think that Jesus knew that once you became a believer and you started following him, you weren't going to have struggles in life? He said the opposite. In this life, you will have trials and temptations and troubles, right? But he did it anyway. He came to clean your issue anyway. And he'll do it again and again and again. This man who did not become unclean after he met the leper, but rather the leper became clean. Our first place to go when we feel this loneliness creeping in is to go to Jesus. To fall at his feet and say, I need you. You've promised to never leave us or forsake us. If you're willing, you can make us clean. You've given us the peace that's so great that we can't even comprehend it. That's the first place we're supposed to go. It's to follow Jesus' feet. But there's another place that we're supposed to go that helps us curb the sense of loneliness in our lives. Did you know, I got, well, you do know that when Jesus, or when God created everything in the beginning of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, he created the heavens and the earth, and he made the light and all of, and darkness and all of those things. And at the end of every time he made those things, what's the words that he said? It is good, right? It is good. But there's one time that God looked down at his creation and said, it is not good. Genesis 2 verse 18 says this, the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. It is not good for man to be alone. We were designed to be relational. We were designed to be in community. In fact, I told the choir this the other night when I was meeting with them. Do you know what the first small group ever was? It was before the beginning of time. It was God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and they were in communion with one another. And then they created man, and they were in communion with man. And even then, God looked down at man and said, it's not good for man to be alone. We were designed to be in community with one another. We were designed to hold each other up. It's in Colossians, and it says that we're supposed to carry each other's burdens. We were supposed to surround ourselves with other people, to be in authentic community with one another. That's why we have emphasis on things in this church like small groups. Because it's crucial. I mean, it's great to come and sit together and to be in these rows, but it's much more better to be in a circle in which you can be authentic with one another and you can be vulnerable with one another and you can talk and lift each other up and you can encourage one another when you need it. And so I, 
I got to thinking, why would people not want to be in small groups? And this, this is not all inclusive, I promise you, but this is just some of the things that popped in my head. Number one is probably busyness, right? I'm just too busy. I've got so much going on between sports activities and homework and, and trying to help the kids and, and all of the things that we've got to do in our lives to get to work. I've got to work late these days, and it just seems like in this world that we live in, we're just so busy. But then there's also fear. Some of us are scared to be vulnerable in front of one another. I don't want people to know who I really am. I'm happy with them just knowing the surface me. I don't want to be authentic with them. Some folks, maybe it's just being tired. You've got the time, but you've worked all day, and you get home, and you just don't want to get back out. And you're just tired and don't want to go to small groups. And then for some of us, and I know we've all been there, sometimes groups are weird. Right? I mean, sometimes you get into a group and you just didn't find those authentic friends that you were going to, uh, you know, spend the rest of your life with and hold each other up. It just didn't click like that, and so you've just written the whole thing off. Sometimes that's the case. Groups are weird. And yet another thing out of that survey that we read earlier said this. 50% of the people surveyed, or almost just under 50%, have one or zero close confidence in their life confidants. They don't have people that they can go to to rely on. There's nobody that knows them well and can be there for them when they need it. That's why we were designed to be in community with one another, to hold each other up, to carry each other's burdens, and to encourage one another when we need it. We have a ton of small groups in this church. We've got small groups on Wednesday night. Uh, we're going to start one here soon on Tuesday night. We've got Bible study that Jerry just started on Monday nights. We've got women's Bible study coming on Thursdays. We've got men's Bible study on Wednesdays. You've got your Sunday school classes. We've got circles. We've got United Methodist men. We've got a ton of small groups that you can be a part of. Our choir and our praise teams are small groups. You know why? Because they pray together and they hold each other accountable and they go fellowship together. They spend time with one another, getting to know one another. We were designed to be in community. What would it look like if we modeled that in our community, that we were in groups together? I mean, even in our children's ministry, in our youth ministry, our children's ministry, the, the, these folks go back there. They're not just sitting back there having playtime. This is not babysitting. They're discipling. They're growing together. They're learning to be in community with one another, how to be, how to, at this age, probably just learning the basic things of sharing and all of those type things so that you can be in authentic community with one another. Or how about our youth group? Those kids come, and not only do they come and fellowship with one another and play games with one another, they get discipled and ministered to, and then we break up into even smaller groups, and they do it again. Living in community with one another. What would it look like if you've got kids and you don't have them in, in the youth group, well, you're missing out. Because one day they're going to fall and you haven't modeled for them how having people in community with you can be there to help pick you up. In fact, this one's not on your outline, but I should have put it on there. Community helps us when we fall. And we all fall. Community helps us when we fall. Ecclesiastes 9, 4, 9 through 10 says this. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. We all fall. Your kid's going to fall one day. And you want them surrounded by people who can encourage them and lift them up, who know them, who can be there to carry the burdens for them. We all fall. In addition to picking us up when we fall, sometimes we need people that can see things that we can't see. You know what I'm saying? We need, thing, need people that can see things that we can't see. If you ever follow behind somebody in a car and you're driving along and you, you're in the left-hand lane and you're right behind them and somebody's in the right-hand lane and you see them put on their blinker and start to move over and they don't see the car in that blind spot, right? And you start honking your horn at them, trying to let them know there's somebody over there. And that person is in that car over there is pointing to heaven, you know, evangelizing and, and, and trying to tell them, hey, and honking their horn, right? And you're trying to help them in their blind spot. 
That's point number three on your outline this morning. Community helps us see blind spots. The things that we can't see. Those real friends that get in there and tell you the things, the hard truths that you need to know. You know, it's not easy to look at somebody sometimes and be like, hey, you got spinach in your tea. But somebody's got to do it. Right? We got to be there to help hold each other up in the things that we can't see. We got to be there in the blind spots that come along because they do come along. Proverbs 27, 6 says this, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Wounds from a friend can be trusted. It is okay to have close enough friends who can tell you the hard truth. Ones who know you enough and love you enough to tell you that, but you love them enough to receive it, the hard truth. We've all been there in our lives where we've had to tell somebody, you know, hey, listen, if you keep going down this path, you may not see it right now, but I'm telling you, I've seen the end of this in so many other stories, and this is not going to turn out the way you think it's going to turn out. We need people in our lives to give us those real truths when nobody else will, people that see those blind spots that we don't see and tell us so that we can turn. That's what community does. It helps helps us see our blind spots. Wounds from a friend can be trusted. And then point number four on your outline this morning is community prevents isolation. Boy, during the pandemic, a lot of folks ended up isolated. You know, I told Steve this one day, and I don't don't take offense to this, uh, when when we had to send everybody home and kind of do the online thing for so long, I'd say, I feel like all we've done is we've moved them from the pew to the couch, but nothing's different. We get isolated in our homes and we get comfortable in those things away from other people and hiding all the things and not being vulnerable in front of them. And we get so used to doing that over time that we get stuck in a rut and we can't get out of it. That we find ourselves more comfortable being isolated and being alone than being in community. Community helps prevent isolation. There's a pastor who said this. He said, a small group is kind of like a retirement account. If you wait, it won't be there when you need it. But if you invest now and you make it a priority, you can draw on it when you need it. Isn't that interesting? A small group is kind of like a retirement account. If you wait, it won't be there when you need it. But if you invest now and you make it a priority, you can draw on it when you need it. There's another pastor that said this. He says, I've never met anyone in authentic community whose broken heart has left them broken. Notice it didn't say we weren't going to have broken hearts. We're going to have them. The Bible is very clear about that. But it said, I've never met anyone who's an authentic community whose broken hearts left them broken. I don't know if Steve has used this story perhaps in one of the the, uh, times I've been away, but I want to tell you a little bit about a runner named Elliot Kipchoge. Now, Elliot is a runner from, uh, was in the Olympics in 2016. He was also in 2020. But in 2016, he won one, of, uh, one gold medal in one of the long-distance marathons that they were running there. And, and he made this decision at, that, uh, at those games that he was going to go and run a marathon in under two hours. 26.2 miles in under two hours. And so he set out to do this, and at the first event that he went to do it at, while he, he was almost successful, he missed it by 24 seconds. That's amazing. 24 seconds. And so somewhat defeated, he decided, well, I'm going to try again. So he goes out and he does it again. And this time, because he was so anxious about the race beforehand, he actually missed this one by almost two minutes, a minute and 50-something seconds. But then he didn't give up. And he decided he was going to try a third time. And so he went out and he went to, to, to do the race, and he finished the race in one minute, 59 seconds. I'm sorry, one hour, 59 minutes, and 40 seconds. He finished the marathon in under two hours. But it didn't count. It didn't count because Kipchoge had a group of friends who decided they were going to come alongside him, and they ran with him, and they encouraged him along the way, and they would flank him at different times to help stop wind resistance so that he could make it all the way through to the end. See, if you show that picture again, you see him choking in the front, but did you notice the runners behind him cheering him on? 
And what Kipchoge said afterwards is he, he said, I found that it was impossible for me to do until I did it with a community. Until I surrounded myself with people who were going to cheer me on, who were going to help me, who were going to find ways to walk with me so that I could accomplish the task. I think that we all have this desire to know and to be known, to understand and to be understood, to belong unconditionally without betrayal and rejection in authentic community. If we were really honest with ourselves, deep down we know that to be true, that we need people in our lives. There's an African proverb that says this, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. This life is a marathon. It's a race. And here we're more concerned with going far than we are with going fast. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions this morning, and it's not my typical way to end a sermon, but I think it's important for you to answer them. If you are not in a small group, will you get in one? I just listed a ton of them earlier. If you are not in a small group, will you get in one? If you noticed earlier on in the title slide, the title is One is a Lonely Number. We're not made to be by ourselves. But underneath that, there was a, a, a comment there that says, Between the Sundays. What are you doing between the Sundays? Perhaps one day Steve and I and Jerry can, can do a series on Between the Sundays. Where is your authentic community besides just Sunday morning? If you're not in a small group, will you get in one? If you are in a small group, will you invest in it? We find ourselves in these groups all the time, but we sometimes just never make ourselves open and invested in it, right? We don't become vulnerable in it. I've been there. I've done it myself. Just gone and, and kind of checked the box and kept on rolling. If you're in a small group, will you invest in it? We were designed to be relational. You see, Jesus came. Pursuing us. This is why I come. This is the purpose, is to make you clean and to be with you in relationship with you. But I've also provided you with a community that you can be authentic in, that you can encourage one another in, that can catch you when you fall, that can point out those hard truths that nobody else will say. Those are the people we need in our lives. Let's go to God in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. The fact that you are willing to come and make us clean. That you were willing, knowing what we were going to face and how we were going to struggle, even after you saved us, you were still willing to do it. And you're still pursuing us today. Lord, we give you thanks that you've given us this innate desire to be in relationships with one another, to be in community with one another, that we can hold each other up, that we can be the ones that carry our fellow man or woman when they can't walk alone. Help us do that. Help us see that. Help us be in authentic community and in communion with you. Lord, we give you thanks for the transformational grace that you have poured on us, that you have changed us, that you've made us clean. We glorify your name this morning and sing praises to you. For it's in your precious son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and continue to worship together this morning as we sing.
was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tool till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my tool. Till I met you God has called us into authentic community with one another, to be in relationships with one another, to hold each other up and carry one another. He has called your name, and he said, I came for this purpose, that no matter what issue you feel like you're known by, I came and I'm willing to make you clean. Find those people around you that can help hold you up this week and help hold you accountable. Go in peace.